June and happy Women's Month, everyone. Welcome to the launch of uh, PIDS for very first book on gender and development titled Outside Looking In, Gendered Perspectives in Work and Education. This activity is in line with the national observance of the Women's Month held in March every, every year. It is also the Institute's way of supporting the celebration of the International Women's Day this year. To, form, to formally begin our activity, may I request our president, Dr. Celia Reyes, for the opening remarks. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Um, to our distinguished guests and speakers, um, of course, Congressman Joey Salceda is on the way from Congress from an important meeting. Um, Ambassador Laura Del Rosario from Miriam University. Uh, Ms. Shona Makina from um, the Australi Australian Embassy. Ms. Janet Kindipan Dulawan from Oxfam. Um, Ms. Bernadette Balamban from PSA, Philippine Statistics Authority. Uh, Ms. Cherry Lou Repia from DepEd. Uh, Mr. Rex Barona from ILO and Ms. Maria Christine Josefina Balmes from our partner Philippine Commission on Women. Colleagues from government, partners and representatives from the academe, civil society and private sectors, and friends from the media. A pleasant afternoon and happy Women's Month to all of you. Uh, we have every reason to celebrate this year's International Women's Month. For one, it marks the 25th year of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action which is a global roadmap to realize gender equality. It is also the 10th year anniversary of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. This is a landmark legislation adopted in October 2000 to recognize the significant role of women in peacekeeping, humanitarian response, and post-conflict reconstruction. Also, this is the 25th year since the Gender and Development Budget Policy was institutionalized through the 1995 General Appropriations Act. The Philippines has been one of the countries with the smallest rates of gender disparity. In 2018, the Gender Development Index, which is calculated as the ratio of female to male HDI, was measured at 1.004. This makes the Philippines as one of the 53 countries in the group with high equality or gender parity among the dimensions of health, education, and income. Similarly, the Philippines has a gender inequality index of 0.425 in 2018, making it 98 out of 162 countries with lower inequalities between women and men in the dimensions of reproductive health, empowerment, and labor market participation. Meanwhile, the Philippines ranking in the global, global gender gap report of the World Economic Forum dropped from 8th in 2018 to 16th out of 153 countries in 2020. This drop was mainly attributable to the wider gap in political empowerment, as measured by the proportion of women in the parliament and ministerial positions. However, looking at the component indices, the Philippines also did not fare very well in terms of labor force participation rates, the rank was 121st, enrollment in primary education, the rank was 83rd, and estimated earned income, the rank was 58th. The current year is also a milestone for PIDS since this is the very first time that we were able to come out with a book on gender and development. The idea of publishing a book on GAD came up in 2018 during one of the meetings of the Institute Gender and Development Group headed by Dr. Connie Dakuikoy, one of our research fellows. Two years after, here we are ready to share the fruit of our labor to the public. We owe this achievement to the efforts of everyone who, in one way or another, have contributed to the completion of the book, which we titled, Outside Looking In, Gendered Perspectives in Work and Education. In particular, let me acknowledge Dr. Connie Dakuikui for her initiative in pursuing um, this project and her team for their endless support. To the authors, um, Dr. Aniseta, Aniseto Urbeta and Vic Paqueo, who unfortunately have um, other meetings today, uh, Ruel Briones, Mike Abrigos here, Lawrence Dacuicoy, and, and Chris Francisco Abrigo. Thank you for your willingness and cooperation in contributing your studies to the book. 
Of course, this would have not been possible without the Research Information Department team headed by Dr. Sheila Siar. Uh, thanks for your assistance in editing and refining the manuscripts and for doing the final layout and design of the book. Let me also thank your team, um, Sina Wang, um, for inviting our participants and coordinating lo the logistics of the venue for today's book launch. As of last night, we were still debating, do we go ahead with the launch or not? Um, so let me also extend my gratitude to people whose names I failed to mention but have done something to make this a reality. Congra congratulations to all of you for a job well done. And to those who have bought and will buy a copy of the book, thank you so much for your support. Please help us promote this book to your friends and networks. It's a good reference for researchers, policymakers, women's rights advocates, teachers and students, and everyone who are interested in gender and development issues. So what are the features of this book? It's a compilation of God's studies done by PIDS authors over the past few years. It has six chapters, uh, and chapter one is the introduction of the book, which gives an outline of the topics featured in each chapter. Chapter two looks into the issue on why boys in recent years are underperforming in school and presents recommendations on how to resolve these challenges. Chapter 3 tackles the educational mobility of men and women and the schooling progression of boys and girls. It identifies regions with high or low educational mobility and human capital accumulation. Chapter 4 provides an estimate of the contribution of men and women in the Philippine economy. In particular, it focuses on disaggregating the value of work and excluded returns from capital. Chapter 5 examines how homework affects both men and women's participation in market work. And lastly, Chapter 6 analyzes the gender wage gap in Philippine agriculture. We will hear a more detailed summary of these topics from the integrative report of Dr. Dakuy Koy later. We'll also be hearing the thoughts of our speakers on these studies after her presentation. We hope that the recommendations in this book will trigger more researches and discussions on gender and development. Definitely, this will not be our first and last book on this topic. PIDS will continue to come out with evidence-based analysis on gender-related issues that can benefit all sectors. I know that you're ready to listen to the presentations and discussion of our speakers. So once again, good afternoon and thank you for being with us here today. Thank you so much, um, Ma'am Sel. Our next speaker is a senior research fellow and a God focal person of PIDS. But prior to joining PIDS, she served as an assistant professor in the economics department of the Ateneo de Manila University and worked as a consultant in the Asian Development Bank, where she collaborated on studies on export-led growth, structural transformation, and potential growth. She has published in the Journal of Development Studies, Journal of Asian Economics, Structural Change and Economic Dynamics, and Applied Economics, among others, on topics such as time use, child labor, poverty, and trade. She obtained her PhD in the economic, in economics rather from Kyoto University. To give us an integrative report about the, about the book, let us all welcome Dr. Connie Dakuikui. <laughs> Pleasant afternoon uh, to everybody. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for being here, here despite the re uh, uh, alert on COVID. Um, uh, this book, as uh, Mamsel had already told uh, before you, uh, that this book is actually a first in many ways. So it is first uh, for PIDS because this is the first gender book. And this is also the first for me because this is the very first book project that I've ever handled. And the experience is very enriching and it's very challenging. So I ended up writing more than I intended. <laughs> and I ended up, you know, uh, rereading and rereading things so that you, you, I can come up with something that is that would tie up everything together, you know, so some, some unifying theme and uh, that, that would put everything together in perspective. And, and, and so when I was doing the, the reading and rereading, I came up with this uh, idea of 
putting together the work and education. So the question is, why are we are we interested with uh, with education? Um, in terms of education, there is no really there is no problem for women. In fact, uh, we've already women have already the rather the target for women have already been achieved. The NDV, NDG target rather have already been achieved. It's actually the boys that have the problem here. Um, boys have uh, higher dropout rates. They have lower enrollments at all levels, and they have lower test scores. So in keeping with the gender and development approach, um, it is only fair that we have to, uh, I see that Congressman Salcedo is here, so maybe I should stop. Yeah, uh, Congressman Salcedo is already here, so maybe I will give my integrative uh, report later. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Yes, sir. So we're waiting for you, actually. So, uh, okay. So let us cut the presentation of Dr. Um, Dakuykuy and um, give way to Congressman Salceda. All right. So to give you a brief um, introduction. Uh, okay. <laughs> He's a congressman of the 2nd Congressional District of the province of Albay. Okay. And um, he has uh, is the principal author of Republic Act Number no. 10 931, or the Universal Access to Quality Tertiary Education Act of 2017, and has um, co-authored 11 other laws, such as Republic Act Number no. 10 936 or the Train Law, uh, Republic Act Number no. 11035 or the Act institu institutionalizing the Balik Scientist Program. Are or the and the Republic Act number 10928, which extends the validity of the Philippine passports to 10 years. He also served as a chairman of the technical working group, which paved the way for the approval of bills, particularly on the creation of the Department of Disaster Resilience and the proposed amendments to the Public Service Act. Without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, let, let us give a round of applause for Congressman Joey Salceda. <laughs> Uh, marami salamat po. Where is everyone? Ay, present pa na. So pwede na akong umuwi. <laughs> uh, Dr. Celia Reyes, President of PIDS, USEC, Diosdado, and San Antonio. Dito ba? Or DepEd? Um, Ms. Maria Christine Masipina G. Balmes, Deputy Executive Director of the Philippine Commission on Women. Uh, Ms. Shona Makina, a Counselor, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Australian Government. Ms. Jeanette Kindipan Dulawan of Oxfam, Philippines, who is still alive. And Dr. Connie B. Dakoykoy, Senior Research Fellow of PIDS and other authors of the book, Outside Looking in Gender Perspectives of Work in Work and Education, which we have launched today. Um, mga, magandang hapo po sa inyong lahat. It is my distinct honor to speak to you, to all of you, this afternoon as we launch this extremely important, relevant publication that provides valuable insights into key catalysts for further narrowing the gender gap in the Philippines. Over the years, we have recognized the role of gender equality in improving overall welfare and sustainable development and this is why laws have been passed to address sexual and reproductive health and rights, as well as gender-based violence. Many times it has been pointed that the Philippines way ahead of countries across the world in attaining gender equality outcomes, especially as we have managed to rate well in the number of international assessments, particularly in the Global Gender Gap Reports of the World Economic Forum that started in 2006. From the first Global Gender Gap Report of 2006, the 14th report in 2019, the Philippines was distinctively cited for being the only Asian country to be in the top 10 performers. However, the most recent 2020 report suggests that the country has regressed in some areas in closing the gender gap, particularly in political empowerment, with female representation in the cabinet declining from 25 to only 10%, that's from between 2017 to 2019. Apparently, 
since I am always controversial, since all the left is left the government, that's why. <laughs> that's putting the country out of the top 10 global performance from eight a year earlier to number 16. But we are still way ahead of many countries globally and st also still being the best performer in Asia. Doing well, however, that does not mean there is no room for improvement. And this is why publications such as this, the gender book, is welcome to policymakers, as this PIDS book examines several important gender issues. Boys falling behind girls in school participation and learning outcomes, unpaid work, and the gender gaps in agriculture. As pointed out in the book we are going to release, that you are going to release today, as well as in other studies on out-of-school children in the, in the country, already released by PIDS, in the Global Gender Gap reports of WEF, the Philippines has made significant strides in closing the gap between girls and boys in school participation. Unlike in most countries where girls' school attendance is far lower, we have the reverse in the Philippines, but that is in itself has also become a cause for concern since all children, whether boys or girls, have a right to basic education. They should, all of them should be in school and should stay in school regardless of socioeconomic background. That's why I've actually asked DEPED for the so-called 70,000 non-readers, whether they are boys or girls. But I know that in Albay, because that is our principal pillar for development, education, when I became governor, the, we were spending only 1% of the total budget and essentially the SEF for education. And then I ramp it up to 34%, essentially saying that um, education is just as important as physical as the human capital formation. Thanks to universal kindergarten, improved resources of the DEPED and the con conditional cash transfer, we have managed to improve access to schooling and primary education for both boys and girls alike. But this is not enough. The sustainable development goals that we have committed to, as well as the Philippine Development Plan, all aim not only for access, but also providing quality education for all. Sadly, various national and international assessments of learning achievements suggest we have fallen so short of this goal. The results of the National Achievement Test administered by DEPED to all, grade 6 and grade 10 students, as well as the results of the 2018 PISA conducted by the OECD, show that our learners may not be learning as we intended, and also that boys are also being outperformed by girls. The results of the PISA, 2018 PISA, PISA in particular showed that 15-year-old students in the Philippines scored lowest in reading, together with those from the Dominican Republic among the participating countries of the PISA 2018. While the performance in mathematics and science of feeding of PISA per participant were, second to the, were also second to the lowest. Further, I'll give you a story. When I was governor, Albay was number 118 out of 123 SDOs or school divisions. But by putting more money into basic education, uh, providing incentive to teacher participation, engagement, as well as um, providing incentive to barangays that organize or support the school. From number one, two, three, I think we became number 19 in five years. There's something that can be done by local governments. There's a missing link there. It's called community. <laughs> So once you mobilize community, actually, it goes a long, long way. So our national achievement test from being number one, two, three, out of one, two, seven, we became number 19. Sabi ko nga, ba't ko hindi matalo-talo tong mataga? Late Ang gagaling magdaya. Day, joke lang. Hindi yun sila nagdadaya. Talagang magaling po yung ano dun. Joke lang yun. Joke, joke, joke. Erase. Yung school na yun, pinuntahan ko pa. Kung sabi ko, ba't ang taas-taas yung mag-score? Mag Our dismal performance in the 2018 PSA, as well as the poor rankings of the country in education quality and the equity dimension of the Global Social Mobility Index should actually come as no surprise. Given that the trends in NOT have been staying for decades, 
that students are performing below standards. For 2018 alone, the mean percentage score on grade 6 NAT was 37.4. I think in Albay, we were able to increase it to 51. Um, while the grade 10 MPS was 44.6, I think we were able to get about 72 by the time I um, graduated as governor in 2016. Kaya po to actually, pagkaisan lang eh. That's suggesting that on the average, students are getting less than half of the test items correct, correctly. For more than a decade, the results of the NAT have likewise been suggesting that girls are doing better than boys. Again, a guy was different because there was a study made also by PIDS where there are more boys in school in Albay than girls. So it could be the reverse. I mean, if you just give incentives for Ang ginawa ko lang dun, although people are questioning the the method, the strategy, I put the the cart in front of the horse. So I made sure that college is free. So that everybody goes into basic education. But that was a very expensive um, experiment. So the repercussions of poor quality education in the country are suggested in the results of the GSMI, GSMR. 2020 of the World Economic Forum, where the Philippines placed 61st out of 82 countries with a social mobility score of 51.7, which placed the country in the bottom half of all countries ranked in the study. Out of seven ASEAN, the Philippines ranks fifth behind Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Thailand that were respectively 28th, 43rd, 50th, and 55th globally. The country, however, outperformed Indonesia and Laos, and the fundamental reality is that the ones who often lose out in quality are the poor and the lower income segments of society. The rich will always find a way to get quality education. So a lack of attention on quality will only further increase inequalities but we that we already currently have, both in outcomes and opportunities. So yun din po yung question ko, I keep making, ano, when I was handled by, I had a choice. Do I build opportunities like tourism? Or do I do capacity building? Where do I put my money? Opportunity seeking, like the tourism push in Kamsur? Or will I do something different in Albay? So sabi ko, kahit pumunta ang investor o hindi, ang mga turista, at least yung mga tao ko, nakapag-aral. So I chose capacity building. If, there, if I had only one peso in my hand, I will definitely give it to capacity building over of opportunity seeking um, what you call local economic development and enterprise development. So that created, kasi yung Albay po from 42% poverty rate, we're now down to 14.1%. So it works because I beggar my neighbor. I sent all my graduates to Metro Manila and they send the money back. But I don't know whether that's, that is a sustainable goal for everyone where we fight all over for the employment opportunities in Metro Manila. Aside from the PISA and the NAT, many other assessments from recent Philippine informal reading inventory, nako, ito na 70,000, to the early grade reading assessment point to gaps in reading skills among our young. Well, they depend as pointed out, the PRI is not a standardized tool, but these results are consistent with the results of other assessments that kids are not having the property proper reading skills. Yung lumabas pa sa 70,000 was done in July. August, you start the feeding program of DEPED. And then by December, they had this validation. So yung 70,000 became 21,000. My problem with that number is that it's grade three to six. So by that year, I don't know whether it's acceptable that you have 21,000 non-readers in grade three to six. That's a lot of non-readers. That's a lot of opportunity. So there's not, nothing more, I think. Ang sagot ko talaga doon, these children went into the basic education cycle already stunted. So the only way to cure that is to really have what I've been pushing in Congress, 
that out of the 75 million people in this country which can go to the labor force, 12 million are not looking for work. Out of the 12 million look, not looking for work, 11.3 million are women and only 700,000 are men. And you look at the 11.3 million women not looking for work, they're essentially housewives. And you break down the housewives from 11.3 mil, million women not, in, not looking for work, and because they're housewives, 4.8 million have children not in school. And of the 4.8 million child housewives with children not in school, 1.78 million was poor. So no wonder you keep getting the same results because at that very, that very critical period in the physical as well as mental development, that, that age between zero to five, the children are deprived of proper nutrition because the housewives have no money and they're poor and they cannot afford, obviously, to get any what you call kasambahay. I don't know what is the English of kasambahay. I don't want to call them maids, but essentially because they cannot find livelihood. And therefore, they're stunted. Because at age 0 to 5, these children, 1.78 million children, have mothers who are poor and cannot work. And therefore, that is the basis for the so-called housewife compensation law which is, I think, the single most important. If you want to solve all this problem about non-readers, you have to look at it from an intergenerational perspective. Meaning to say, each generation just simply contributes so automatically, so generously to the next generation's ignorance. Because we're not taking the appropriate state action. Uh, by the way, all my bills in Congress are mostly done by PIDs. So, so what we have now are behavioral insight on why this is happening and what can be done, and this is a major blind spot. This is the challenge I give to researchers, not only from PIDs, but to all researchers. Wag tayong academic. Kailangan po, yung mga ginagawa nyo maging batas, Kailangan po yung policy yung maging is affirmative action by the state on behalf of those who do not have the capacity to fight for a better life. That the studies of paid should prompt positive consequences in the lives of ordinary people. Make this a better country which, have, which promises a better future. If you could plant an ambition in the heart of every, of every kid, then I think to myself, I must have done already the correct thing in my whole political life. So, may that mga bahaba nyo kasi magsulat. So, I am glad that the DepEd is represented here as we have to start admitting that our country faces serious systemic problem in basic education that requires systemic solutions. If nothing changes by 2030, then more than half of young Filipinos would read, reach adulthood without the skills they need for jobs of the future, that they can increase the livelihood of their social mobility. That is why I am pushing for comprehensive education reform agenda. Ay, nako. Ako po testigo kasi may tatlo po ako malalaking eskwela na alaga dun po sa aking distrito. Daraga National High School with 7,000, the largest in Albay. I have Malabog National High School and I have Anaslaga National High School. Kitang kita ko po talaga ang problema. Yung mga teacher ko, tinuturuan ng Immanuel Kant yung mga bata. Eh ako nga hindi ko naiintindihan yung Portugal College ko sa Ateneo. Ngayon ko na lang naiintindihan. After going through all the learnings, lifelong learning, sa ko lang naiintindihan ano meaning ni Immanuel Kant. Tinuturuan nila. Hums, humes. It's there. It's there. In humes. It's there. Ang nakita ko lang na may matinutin nung kinalalabasan, TBL. 
Tapos ninanakaw nyo pa sa Tesla lahat ng teacher. May isa po rin matino din. Think of STEM. Pero wala naman patutunguhan kasi pakalampas mo ng STEM. Kaya lang naman ang ilan naman ang kanilang opportunities for higher studies. Remember that in this country, only 21% finish college. So para saan yung STEM? Tapos, yung gas, Diyos ko, Mario Josep, sabi ko, ano pang ginagawa ng gas dito? General academic strand. Pagka-graduate mo ng grade 12, di mo alam kung anong naintindihan sa buhay. Ang meron-meron, ABM, STEM, at YUMS, Diyos ko, wala nga eh. Yung mga YUMS, dapat pumasok ng Ateneo. Yung liberal arts humanities lang talaga ang pupuntahan nun. Pero alam mo, ako, engaged na engaged po ako sa mga schools ko. At kitang-kita ko po kung anong problema. Tapos, ipiprivatize natin through the voucher system, which is essentially giving. Sana wala dito ang taka-private. Huwag na, I will not make that statement. So, hirap na hirap po talaga ako. Makita kung saan. Tingnan mo lang yung doktor natin. 141,000 na nakapasa. 84,000 ngayon ang active. Of the 84,000, only 10,000 is primary. Tapos mag-universal healthcare ka? 64,000 ang lahat ng mga doktor dito are specialist. It doesn't address 64,000 of the 84,000 are specialists. Only 10,000 are family physicians. So, paano yung UHC mo na yan? Wala yan. Ranggang yan. Eh. Sino man nagbikulano dito? Anyway, so I will no longer... <laughs> that includes concrete time-bound action plans. Anyway, so uh, there's a very long speech which was crafted by a lot of my uh, advisors in education, but definitely after all these economic, after all these uh, fiscal policy changes, especially CITIRA, I think um, uh, mas, uh, I'd like to really focus on education. Pero mukhang ang, ang DEPED, mukhang tingin sa akin, pain in the ass. So mukhang mas, mas maganda kung mag-focus na lang ako sa TESDA at tulungan sila. Dahil yun, nandun po yung future ng Pilipinas. Nasa TESDA. Wala ako sa... Kung pwede lang po i-elevate ang pananaw ng ang worldview ng Pilipinas patungkol po away from that everybody goes to college to one that really sees TESDA as the most viable education option for almost 58.7% of this country by in terms of the needed skills, then I believe that it is a, a better way forward. Waka magagalit taga deped. Sino taga deped dito? Ay, buti tinitingnan ko to. Ka Kaaway nyo ba ako? Ah, okay. Pero bakit ganun? <laughs> Alin, ganun kayo ngayon? pinapost-post niya sa akin yung public schools of the future, tapos nung hiniring ng committee on education, basic education, ni isa, wala pumunta sa inyo. Tapos, ka, ka, oh, kayo pa yung nagpasulat sa akin. Tapos nung hiniring na, ni isang representative ng DEPED, wala. Oh, sino naman? Hindi, kaya sabi ko, eh, sa TESDA na lang ako, ayoko na sa DEPED talaga. The joke lang. <laughs> All I'm saying is that uh, this is part of my frustration in uh, advocating changes, reforms in our political economy. And uh, we need to do more, especially policy, especially kanyo pong mga nag-aaral. Kasi kahit papano po, nung una, nagalit na galit sila sa akin, bakit daw kailangan sweldohan ng mga housewife, nung makita na nila yung epekto, lalong-lalo na dun sa Albay, 70,000 non-readers, Ngayon nyo naiintindihan ko bakit ang mga housewife, yung mga nanay na mga bata na wala sa school at mahirap, eh kailangan na pong tulungan. Kaysa naman tulungan mo, eh, ibig sabihin niya kung minsan yung, yung four piece is too late. By the time they go to school, they're already stunted. 
So how far can that for peace reverse the time we're in, the critical period in their intellect, in mental and physical development so that you can achieve the kind of outcomes that you want from the basic education cycle. So the, with that, I will not read it. I will just leave it to you. Uh, and congratulations for, for PEDS. And I have defended you for almost how many budget hearings? No questions asked, no presentation. No. Because I truly believe that you should be, kahit nung inaaway kayo ni Andaya, nung chairman ng APRO, kahit kayo inaaway nung lahat po dun sa kongreso, dahil yung sinasabi nyo, kontra sa gusto ng administrasyon, ni minsan kayong tinanong sa floor. Dahil po talaga naniniwala ko na dapat you should be insulated from the, 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 the dysfunctional dynamics of the political economy of this country. So with that, I would like to thank you again for giving me this opportunity to share my frustrations. <laughs> but we have a very decisive president. Kaya kung kakayanin ko, eh, mas marami po tayong magagawa para po sa inaharap, lalong-lalo na po para sa mga bata at mga kababahiyan po ng ating pong lipunan. So maraming salamat at magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Thank you so much, Congressman Salceda. And just so everyone knows, we are uh, being live streamed, so whatever you say in front is final. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much once again, um, Dr. Salcedo, for uh, supporting PIDS. Um, but before we let you go, let us first have um, a short photo ops with, with a good uh, Congressman. So may I call on our um, speakers? to uh, on stage for the for the photo ops <laughs> yes sir we have something for you So thank you so much once again, um, Congressman Salceda. So we, we now proceed to the uh, integrity report of Dr. Dakuike. Okay, 
wonderful. As I was saying, no, um, we were able to come up with um, the overarching theme of work and education. So why work? Uh, why education? Uh, education, we don't have problems when it comes to women. Uh, it is the boys that have problems. Uh, boys have high dropout rates. They have uh, lower enrollment uh, at all levels. And they have lower test scores. Uh, but in terms of work, uh, the problem here is that even though women have already uh, attained a lot in terms of education, it does not get translated into, the, into their labor market participation. So if we take a look at the women's labor force participation, no, from nine, nine, 1990, it's around 48%. And in, in 2018, it's around 51%. And so you will see that there's just like three to four percentage points increase in the span of three decades. So that's really, really small. Uh, and and you, 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 will, you get to think what happens to their education. It does not get translated into their labor market participation. So where are they? So uh, just like uh, Congressman Saceda said earlier, it has something to do with them uh, being, in the, uh, being uh, in, the house, uh, in the household, doing housework. I'm not saying, we are not saying here that doing housework is, not, is bad at all or it's bad, completely bad. No, there are good things that come with doing housework. For example, it, you, you're able to spend more time with your children. So it, it is not necessarily bad. But what we're trying to say here is that, okay, the Philippines is missing out on a lot of things. Women have skills, women has potential, women has knowledge that, can, that they can share. And if around 50% of women are working, so there are 50% who are not contributing to the economy. Um, in fact, the Philippines has the, the among the ASEAN, uh, ASEAN nation, the Philippines has one of the uh, lowest part, uh, labor force participation rate. And so that is the overarching theme that we're uh, looking at, uh, work and education. Um, so um, uh, the book has five chapters, two chapters in education, and three chapters in work. Uh, in the the Chapter two, the first chapter, um, it takes off from the idea, from the empirical, um, from the stylized facts that I've already mentioned earlier. No, it takes off from the fact that boys are, are underperforming; they are lagging behind in terms of education, uh, and and we have to be, uh, we have to, to look into this. Why? Because we are looking at the gender and development framework uh, where both men, you know, gender, gender and development is not just about women. It has to be both men and women being able to partake into the, into you know, share into the fruits of development. No? So we, we all have to move for, forward, both men and women, both boys and girls. So that is the general idea. No, we are looking into the God framework and we have to take a look into this uh, education issue. And chapter two essentially is saying that, okay, there are many critical factors that that uh, that the government should look into. There are government, uh, there, there, sorry, there are demand side factors, uh, and there are supply side factors. In the demand side, we have um, social expectations, we have norms, we had employment opportunities that the government need to look, look into, and on the supply side. Um, we have to look into the uh, learning environments in school. So, for example, um, our, our, you know, boys might have uh, differentiate, you know, the boys might have um, different ways of learning. They have different learning trajectories. And so there must be some sort of, of way such that it, it should be incorporated in the way that learning is done in the classroom. Differentiated learning in a way. Um, uh, for example, the number of, of teachers in, in, the, in, in, the, in schools, it, uh, female teachers versus the number of uh, male teachers, it might or it might not matter, but the, 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 the point that is being driven by, by the, the, this chapter is, has something to do with the fact that we have to look into these issues because these issues might, might, might be, uh, uh, you know, it might mesh together such that it, it creates this problem uh, in terms of uh, boys underperforming in the education front. Uh, and then the second chapter, uh, rather rather chapter three in the book, is that it, it takes a little bit, you know, different kind of perspective in the sense that it uh, agrees with the fact that um, the 
at the aggregate level, it is true that boys are really lagging behind. But if you take a re but if you take a, a regional perspective, there comes there there is a difference in the sense that there are regions that are not really lagging behind. There are regions such as NCR, Calabarzon, and Caraga, where both men and women or boys and girls have comparable um, uh, educational outcomes. And so this chapter of the book uh, identifies regions where educational mobility and human capital accumulation are high and low. And this, this chapter is actually good in providing information in terms of targeting. So for example, if you're interested in uh, looking at best practices, then this chapter can, can tell you which region can you go into so that you can learn more on the best practices in school at home. Okay, so the, the chapter four naman, essentially chapters four, uh, chapters four, five, and six has something to do with uh, work, no? And here in chapter four, what, uh, what they did here is they wanted to estimate uh, women's work and yung work that, 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 that's being referred to here is not just the market work, but it, it's also non-market work. So both more work, um, market work, and both non-market work. And this chapter has estimated the value of both work. And it, it, has, some, it has estimated along the lines of around 12, 12 trillion pesos, right, Mike? Around 12, 12, 12 trillion pesos, both paid and unpaid work, um, and around 10% of that is contributed by women. So around um, around 1.1875 trillion pesos uh, uh, is 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 uh, uh, accounted for by the work housework of women. Um, but more importantly, this chapter. Um, goes beyond the monetary valuation of paid work and unpaid work. Um, uh, it also provides estimates, no? it also provides evidence in terms of the association of parental time inputs and children's schooling outcome. In particular, it found that um, if women, or rather if parents are, are have more inputs in, 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 at, uh, in their home, spending more time with their children, children are, are, no, are, are, are found to have better uh, schooling outcomes. And, and in a way, uh, it, it uh, is consistent with the findings of other studies where housework is important in nurturing not only the current generations, but also the future generations. So the contribution of women is not necessarily in the market work, but also in non-market work. Because as we have said before, no, um, yun nga, they are nurturing uh, generation across generation by doing this type of, of work. So housework is not necessarily bad. Um, but the uh, next chapter takes on a slightly different perspective. No? It acknowledges it acknowledges the the the, the arguments of the, the other chapter, no? in the sense that it acknowledges that women's contribution is not necessarily in the market work, um, but rather we, we wanted what we wanted to do is we wanted at, at in this chapter, no, this chapter provides evidence uh, on the effects of housework on lab, the labor force participation of women. No, and and, and it, this is important. I think that for me this is important because it it it, it is some sort of um, it provides evidence or, and support to policies that are related with, for example, achieving work-life balance, improving child care services, and anticipating demand for elderly care. And then the last chapter, which is really work, no work in agriculture, um, the. To begin with, there are already work-life tensions that's going on between the productive and reproductive roles that are being assumed by women. So am I going to work or, or uh, 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 will I work or will I not work because I have children? And once I decide to go to the marketplace, I, con I am confronted with the problem of pay gap. And, and, and the, the interesting thing here in this chapter is that there, there appears to be glass ceiling, no, even in the agricultural sector. Um, the study uh, found that for exactly the same activity that does not require um, physical strength, there is a pay differential. 
So even in agricultural sector, the there is a glass ceiling there, and it's really interesting because there are really there are studies already, uh, and even even aggregate data, no, it will tell us that the Philip the Philippine Filipinas or uh, women have higher higher wages now, but that's at the aggregate, no, it's at the aggregate. If we look at the disaggregated level, that's where the 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 narrative a, a, nar a different narrative comes into place. So so these. Um, studies, no. Uh, in, I, I'm not going to, to to really, really discuss everything because, uh, you know, <laughs> at least try to read the book. Um, but the the point is that we're trying to make is that okay, the ways forward. Um, the the book is actually um, uh, pu pushing forward for more disaggregated data collection because I think that one of the best way for you to make uh, issues visible is through data. No? Um, and one one way for us to be able to do more research is to have um, disaggregated uh, data collection and 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 in this type of things were already reflected in 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 the chapters no we need disaggregated data in order to, to get a move, more nuanced analysis more nuanced understanding um, and and uh, at this point no at this point um, we have already, uh, we are looking for at ways forward. We are looking at emerging issues. Uh, and I know for a fact that investing in women are, are doing something on uh, influencing norms and attitudes. Uh, the ILO, for example, is interested in migration. And they're also interested in women in STEM. No, PIDS is, uh, um, there, there are plans in uh, doing more work on housework and productivity. Um, time poverty and and in this new uh, work arrangement in dig digital labor platform so these are emerging issues that we are currently interested in um, and we have invited uh, a good number of speakers who, who can share emerging issues with us uh, so that because uh, I think that this book launch is really a celebration no? It's a celebration of the, 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 this book, but it's also a coming together of like-minded people. So we are a community of learners uh, and researchers, and we wanted to learn from each other. And so with that, I'm going to stop here uh, so that the speakers can um, share their thoughts on emerging issues. Of course, if they wanted to say something nice about the book, then it's very much welcome as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Dr. Dekuikui, for your presentation. We are, we are now ready to hear from our set of reactors. Let me introduce to you the first speaker. She is a gender advisor at the of Oxfam Philippines. Prior to her current post, she was a supervising gender specialist at the Technical Services and Regional Coordination, Coordination Division of the Philippine Commission on Women. She finished her Bachelor of Science in Commerce, major in economics at the St. Louis University in Baguio City, and obtained her Master's of Arts in Development Studies from the Netherlands through a fellowship grant. She is also an alumnus of the International Institute of Social Science, rather Social Studies of Erasmus University in, at, uh, at, the Hague, at the Hague in Netherlands. Friends, I give you Ms. Jeanette Kindipan Dulawan. Thank you very much. So, yes, as was mentioned by our colleague from PIDS, yes, I've been with PCBW for 13 years <laughs> before going to Oxfam. So, um, I also reviewed the book from the perspective of um, government uh, employee as one of the reviewers of God plan gender plans and budgets, and then, of course, as a gender advisor from Oxfam. First of all, I would like to comment, of course, that PIDS specifically is gender and development focal point system for taking the lead in this research. Rarely do we have these kinds of God-related endeavors undertaken by institutional mechanisms such as the God focal point systems from government organizations. Thank you also for the, to the authors for this well-thought research for using numerical and empirical data to bring up another nuanced gender analysis of gender equity in boys' education. 
education, mobility of women and men, implications of housework, women's participation in the labor force and the wage gap between women and men in the agricultural sector. Allow me now to share my insights, other emerging gender issues worthy of further research and ways forward. In chapter one, the gender equity in education, uh, there's the mention that the Philippines is one of the countries where female vis a vis male education has progressed so much that boys now need to catch up with girls. By recognizing that there is an issue in terms of boys' progress in education, this is a good way of reinforcing the meaning of gender equality. That is, recognizing that equal rights and opportunities for girls and boys should be pursued vigorously regardless whether they are born male or female in order for them to reach their potentials. In relation to this, boys' progress in education can also be further explored by having a nuanced research on what progress in education means vis-a-vis -vis the fourth SDG goal on education that is to ensure in inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. This means going beyond parity in enrollment or completion rate between girls and boys, women and men. Using gender a gender lens in looking at the factors why more, more boys drop out of school shows how our gender role expectations on boys, girls impact also on their choices and opportunities. One of the stereotypes reinforced or presented in the book is that boys need to f no further education because they are already expected to help in bringing additional income to the family, thus diminishing their opportunities that a higher education might contribute in making them reach their potentials as individuals and as citizens. On the other hand, the expectation that girls should stay in school since they are expected to provide consistent care work for the er elderly also reinforces the stereotype that girls or women should be relegated to unpaid care work, which might impact on their experience of multi multiple burden while pursuing both their productive and reproductive roles. In here, we can see how stereotypes and ascribed gender roles impact on the lives and opportunities of girls and boys, including their educational progress. However, it is also important to analyze this in terms of how structural and institutional bar barriers can also impact on the educational progress of boys as well as girls. We'll, we, use the, we can use the framework AAAQ, that is ac availability, accessibility, affordability, and quality. In the book, uh, there's the situation of boys lagging behind that girl, that of girls is called as reverse gender inequality phenomenon. However, this was not vigorously explored or discussed. Why it is considered as reverse gender inequality? What do we mean by, by this? If it would have been girls lagging behind, will we call it reverse gender inequality? In my personal opinion, it is, it is still gender inequality whenever boys Girls, women, men have unequal access to, our enjoy to their enjoyment of rights, as well as the assumption of stereotypes, social and cultural and gender roles. There was also an, a mention in the book of, that the development community benignly ignored observations that boys in some areas of the world actually lag behind girls in educational attainment. This, at it said, this attitude is understandable in light of feminist agenda and the perception that ensuring fair treatment of boys is not a priority issue, given the huge global challenge of raising women's status to towards parity, parity with men's. Please note that it's never the intention of feminist agenda to consciously ignore the gender issues of men and boys. Its primary concern is to promote gender and sex e equality and inclusion live in a society where the voices of all genders are considered and respected and find fulfillment of their basic needs and rights. In fact, one of the critical areas of the P BPFA is for duty bearers to implement strategic actions to end inequalities and inadequacies in and an unequal access to education and training. In this case, the research can also be used in understanding the differentiated needs and issues of girls and boys in access to education and training and possible policy and structural recommendations responding to these issues. Using the robust data that the research presented, another opportunity that can be explored for, from the UN uh, Gender Equality Indicators Report is to look at how stereotypes in school environment, stereotypes and gender biases impede, impede boys or even girls' potential and achievement 
and why poor families tend to withdraw boys from school. It could have also been better if gender bias grading, including effect of having female or male teachers on the performance of students, were further explored in this research using the, the data that the authors have already. It is important to further study, delve into how well this phenomenon impact on the sex and expected ascribed gender roles of girls and boys and its implications to gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, of course, I agree with the conclusion, especially when raising that the economic performance of one group should not be at the expense of another group. To quote UNESCO's Director General Irina Bokova, education is a shared responsibility between us all, government, schools, teachers, parents, and private sectors. Accountability for these responsibilities defi defines the way teachers teach, students learn, and government act. It, may, it must be designed with care and with the principles of equity, inclusion, and quality in mind. Thus, additional researches or assessment of educational programs, project facilities may include assessment of the education and training needs of women and men, girls, and boys, Facilities that will address the different education and training needs of girls and boys. Facilities that will provide opportunities for expanding the roles and career opportunities of young women and men. Opportunities for training and scholarships that are equally accessible to women and men, girls and boys in different groups, from the rural, from the urban, from different ethnic groups. We also have to look into the constraints to participation. We have to look at if there are facilities that address the time and distance constraint that girls and boys could attend classes. Are there also societal attitudes or cultural factors that prevent girls or young boys or boys or young men from attending school or training programs, among others? To conclude, um, in addition, let us be mindful of the appropriate use of the words sex and gender in our researches. Unconsciously, these two words were used inter interchangeably despite having different meanings. This brings me to my next point for us to be conscious of how heteronor heteronormative approaches, including researches, to tend to invisibilize gender issues and concerns of people with diverse soji. It is also important to note that when doing gender-related re researches or undertakings, we should also consider the intersectionalities of ethnicity, class, gender, age, among others, as they apply to individuals or groups, providing us awareness of any given individual or group's multifaceted experiences and realities. Let me go again to my comments to chapters four and five, two of my favorite chapters, of course. Counting women's work in the Philippines and examining women's low labor market participation rate in the Philippines. This is, of course, a commendable effort to discuss and provide relevant data and information in counting women's work and how unpaid care work or housework implicate women's labor force participation in economic development in the Philippines. This research is relevant especially to the SDG 5.4 goal that is to recognize and value unpaid care and domestic work through the provision of public services infrastructure and social protection and promotion of shared responsibility within the household and the family. Let me share with you Oxfam's um, endeavor in terms of looking at the unpaid care and domestic work in 2016 to 2019 when it um, implemented the We Care project, which specifically aimed to test the comprehensive intervention to reduce unpaid care and domestic work that negatively affects women and girls' well-being and time use in some parts of the Philippines. It used the four R's framework that is, to rec that is to confront unpaid care work as a gender equality issue by recognizing, reducing, and redistributing care work and ensuring those who perform unpaid care are represented in policy decisions about, this, about it. As part of the effort, a three-year study called the Household Care Survey was initiated in 2014. It was used as a baseline for the study in the Philippines in 2017. The program provided women and partner communities access to water, 
infrastructure, and time and labor-saving labor -saving equipment through various awareness-raising activities such as communication campaigns and training. The program also challenged gendered social norms to address heavy and unequal unpaid care work. In one of the surveys conducted in select uh, areas in Eastern Samar, Leyte, Eastern Visayas, and North Cotabato, Maguindanao, and Sultan Kudarat in Central Mindanao, there was, um, in terms of the survey, among women, the decrease in secondary and paid care work is more evident compared to primary care work. In 2018, girls aged, 80, aged 18 to 21 spent slightly less time than boys in unpaid care work. Water collection was highly valued among all male and mi mixed sex youth focus groups with lack of reliable water sources and the resulting difficulties in fetching water as the main reason cited. Compared to 87% in the 2017 survey, there was a decrease in the percentage of female survey respondents who approved of couple sharing and paid care and paid work in Eastern Visayas and an increase in Central Mindanao. In Central Mindanao, decisions in most areas of farm work ex except marketing of produce are still dominated by men, while decisions within the household, including pregnancy and other matters pertaining to reproductive health, are made mostly by women. We Care's partners have started to link up with other stakeholders, especially the national government agencies, barangay and local government officials, and other civil society groups, including women's rights organizations, to continue and broaden the reach of care work interventions and project benefits. Overall, there is evidence on unpaid care work reduction and redistribution. However, more sustained effort may be needed to shift norms regarding care work before awareness can be translated into positive behaviors. Nonetheless, efforts on recognition and representation are gaining more traction among various stakeholders. Given these findings, the following are recommended. Develop specific actions and strategies towards providing access to other time use options for women, particularly economic paid work, and supporting women's decision making in relation to time freed from care work. Test strategies towards more effort in shifting gendered social norms on care work that can translate in, into actual behavior change. Strengthen infrastructure and institutional support in addressing care work issues. For PIDS specifically, to explore further research and assessments relevant to care work and to related initia initiatives, including examining gender dynamics, further and engaging local frameworks and policies to identify opportunities for how unpaid care work can be embedded in current gender and development implementation efforts. Addressing challenges on unpaid care work initiatives is complex and can be viewed from different perspectives. Acknowledgement that this is also a human rights concern could further push the work that has already been started. This cannot be done without the help of various partners and stakeholders who believe in bringing justice to each household in the area of care work. Let me end my um, comment by uh, leaving this question to you. If we, les if, we les if we lessen unpaid care and domestic work, who will gain and who will lose? Thank you very much. Thank you for your insights, uh, Ms. Jeanette. Now for our, for our next um, reactor. She's, uh, she was a former Foreign Affairs Undersecretary in charge of uh, international economic relations. She was the chair of the senior officials meetings when the Philippines chaired and hosted the APEC in 2015. She's now the president of uh, Miriam College. As a career diplomat, she has served as a foreign service officer in Vienna, Singapore, Washington DC, New Delhi, and Vietnam. She was appointed as the Philippine ambassador to India in 2003 until 2007 and to Nepal in a concurrent capacity. And from 2007 to 2009 to Vietnam, she is also an uh, eminent fellow in the Council of Fellows at the Development Academy of the Philippines and a member of the Distinguished Fellows of the Asian Institute of Management. We are honored to have with us today Ambassador Laura Del Rosario. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, 
first of all, I want to thank Bids for inviting me to be part of this launch. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. Um, I worked closely with Bids. I worked closely with Bids when I was at the DFA when we were hosting the APEC 2015. And I'm very grateful that we were together when we launched the Blueprint for the Future 2015 and beyond. First of all, I have to clarify, I'm not an economist, okay? That's why my presentation today is more like, um, you might say, anecdotal. But I've been in education ever since I graduated from college. Um, and, and, and so my comments are really based on what I've seen and what I have observed. So I hope um, I will not be very, I cannot afford to be going into technicalities because, you know, I, I will, it, it's, not, it's not my forte. To, to start with, I was not surprised when the findings said that the academic achievement of females uh, was higher by two or more years. And I, I knew this way back, it's almost revealing my age, as early as 1974. Because at that time, Ateneo de Manila, de la Salle, and other universities that used to be predominantly male became co-educational. And at that time, I was the director of admissions at the then Marinol College. Those of you who are old enough, you, knew, you know that once upon a time, there was a school known as Marinol College. It was an American college, okay? So I suspected that there was something wrong in the admission process. I said, maybe they're running out of boys. And somehow, the, the girl, they had to open it to the girls. But at the same time, I thought it was also part of the liberalization of the male schools and adding diversity to their population, which I welcome because at this time, the male counterparts, or rather the male colleges counterparts in the United States also opened to females, you know, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, Dartmouth, and everybody else. To make the story short, all of the traditional male colleges, including San Beda, have opened their gates to females, but the women's colleges have remained women's colleges. That says a lot, isn't it? That somehow women went to the male colleges and yet we women colleges stayed predom exclusively <coughs> female, so that means we still have a market for the single sex <coughs> university. But what surprised me really, or okay, second, I'm glad that during those years they also removed the gender quota. I was a victim of the gender quota. Somehow, I was discovered when I was, when I was a senior in high school that I had the aptitude to become a mechanical engineer. I had, the, I had the skills, I had the interest. But I haven't met, have you met a female mechanical engineer? Have you? But interestingly, the engineering schools were opened, I think, 20 years after I had graduated, but during my time, it was almost like, you know, you're crazy if you try to get into an engineering school, you're a female. In fact, I was trying to get into a medical school as an alternative, and there was a quota of one to two, meaning for every single female, they accepted two boys. Even if we girls, I assume, got higher grades. And at the same time, too, the same case was also for the, for the law school. So in other words, these were removed later on, and I don't know whether it was because of the rights of girls versus the rights of boys, or whether because they were running out of students to accept, because there are more and more girls entering you know, into these fields. That's so why I, I wish somebody gave me the statistics. How many girls now, or females, are graduating from law, from medicine, from engineering, versus the boys? And how many of these predominantly co-ed schools, what is the gender you know, ratio in their, in their, uh, in their enrollment? Second, um, I was also thinking, I was, what surprised me was that the women, women's participation in the labor force is just 49%. All along I thought that the choice of whether marriage or career was gone with my generation. Because the graduates ahead of my peer group, my cohorts, they were still deciding whether to get into a career or to get married. And I remember the, peop the women ahead of me, as soon as they got married, they stopped working. Whereas my friends and all of us, we said whether we get married or not, we'll continue working. So all along, I thought all the males, females were like that. And it's surprising, therefore, that people, or rather 
uh, some women or some some women decided to go into the what they call the the traditional life roles of being the ilaw ng tahanan or you know being the caregiver. And the question is this: What happened to the extended family? Isn't it supposed to be why women can afford to have five, six children? It's because of the extended family. Because there was a grandmother who would take care of the other children, right? And yet, at the same time, if now the, the reproductive rate of women is now 2.7, what happened? Isn't it, shouldn't it be that there, there are the grandparents? Or am I assuming that the grandparents are still busy working now? You know, or is it because the grandparents have too many children and too many grandchildren to take care of? <laughs> okay. Now, uh, in my case, I, I asked the help of my mother to help me when I was raising my children. And then there was a role reversal later on. I became the caregiver of my mother. And of course, it was difficult for me because I am an only child. <coughs> so being an only child, <coughs> and being sandwiched is really complicated. <coughs> the day on my way to work, I read an article in the Philippine Inquirer of a man who was abandoned by her only daughter. Did you see that article? <coughs> and then I thought, maybe I said she abandoned the father because <coughs> she had to work to take care of her own children. I'm sorry. Okay. I hope this is not the COVID thing. Okay. <laughs> No, I think I'm talking too fast. Anyway, so 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 uh, I I wish I, I mean may, I'm just wondering really uh, where do the extended family come come in? When does it come in in relation to the role of women? You know, in taking care of children, is there a, is can we do a relationship here, or because I'm just doing an anecdotal right, and then at the same time too, I mean. Why is it that Filipino women do not want to stop at two? They, uh, I mean, all the, all the young, except for my friends, all of us had two children. And I suppose my friends were unique. But, but somehow, every time I talk to the parents of our own children, now for our own students, they always, almost always have three children. It's a boy and a girl and a spare. You know, in case something happens to one of the children, they still have another one. And there are, there's also the belief, it's also traditional, that they want, they want to have girls, right? Especially for parents who only have boys. In fact, I gave birth to two boys, and I was always questioned, always got the question, Lula, why don't you have a, try to have a girl? And then I said, why? Two are enough for me. But you must have a girl. I said, why should I have a girl? Because it's a seven-year-old. Who will take care of you when you're old? Why I said, do we give birth to girls just so they will take care of us when you're old? You know, I, I mean, it's it's a very traditional role. And then, of course, and then and then and then I I, I always thought it was it would be a, a dishonor or a disrespect for a baby girl to be born just so she's being seen as the future caregiver. Isn't that a, a, the highest insult that you can give to a baby? Okay. Now, putting that aside, you have heard of stories of couples who tried to get a girl despite so many boys until they end up with five or six children until they hit a girl. Then they stop multiplying. It's as though, uh, you know this, right? I'm not making a joke out of it. I, I just find it very, very absurd. And then, of course, and then when, when you go, and then when these women get into this life choice, okay, I won't work. I'll take care of my husband, I'll take care of my children. And then later on, what if they end in an abusive relationship? Now, this is really true. When in 2001, when I went to, sorry, Joey Salceda is not here anymore, <laughs> when I went to, to his region to talk about the, remember at that time we were trying to uh, campaign for the violence against women law? So I was talking to a group of women that were, you know, that were, who were organized by, at that time, it was not yet PCW. It was the National Commission on the Role of Filipino Women, the NCRFW. So I was there as a speaker. And so I was trying to explain to them why this law is important. And then, of course, it led to something like, if you're always being abused, I said, would you consider being divorced? All of them said no. So I was a little bit aghast. And I said, you mean you wouldn't support a divorce law? This was in 2001. That's 18 years ago. And their reply was, 
Who will take care of our needs? Where will I get food to feed my children? How will I live? How will I survive? And I said, you mean to tell me that you're willing to exchange your body, the abuses on your body, just so you could eat? You know, it became a moral issue for me, but then I could not pursue it anymore because they might say, oh, you have, you're talking like that because you have a job. But then at the same time, if we are better educated than boys, then why don't we have jobs? Then why do we sacrifice our own academic training to take on the supportive role? While our husbands, assuming that they're less educated, they're the ones who take on the role of provider. I'm trying to see here the discrepancies. Are those boys who are better educated, really, do they become the providers? Or are there marriages that the woman is always better educated than the male? Because if you're going to this national, then national, uh, the, the same time trying to say, if the trend is the boys are less academically prepared than girls, then why are they the ones going to the labor market. Does that mean that our labor market is poorly prepared? Is that the reason why we are still in this level of, of economic development? Look at Vietnam and Singapore and Malaysia. The labor participation of their females is very high. Is there a correlation between the labor market participation of females who are better prepared with the economic development of a country? Do I make sense? Okay, if I'm not making sense, that, that means I don't understand the book. But I, <laughs> but I am making sense, okay? I'm, I'm just trying to see why, why women opt out of the labor force when perhaps they're better prepared than their husbands, assuming it's a general trend that we are better prepared. Okay, now of course we have to look at the, um, I'm now questioning the quality of our labor force. If the women got into the, into the labor force, into the labor market, will our labor force be better? Is this the reason why investments coming into the Philippines are not as technically better than those investments going to Vietnam? Are they looking at us? Do investors know that our women are not really into the labor force? Because when I was in Vietnam, I was looking at the investments going there. I said, wow, they're, they're attracting better investments than we do. I said, what makes them attract those investments when they don't speak English? And we say, we better, we're better at English, blah, blah, blah. And they said, does it matter when you get into the technical aspect of labor force? Okay. Perhaps our English language fluency is good when we, you go into the BTO, into the services, but in other skills. So at the same time, there's, so we're now talking of women who are not just the provider of the care, or not just in the care economy for their children, but they're also in the care economy for their parents. So now we are really sandwiched, and so therefore it's as though this is our, this is our ultimate eternal role, you know, to be taking care of our parents when they're old and our children when they're young. So I also want to know, if this is the case, then shouldn't there be perhaps a means for women to be able to re-enter the labor market sometime in their lives when they're done with taking care of their children until they get caught again by taking care of their, grand of, of their parents. Uh, it happened to me. I, I had my mother, she helped me raise my children. When my children reached teenage, should, then it was her time turn to be taken care of by me. So I really just had maybe two or three years when I wasn't taking care of anybody. Okay, it's, it's that. Maybe because I got married late also. Maybe if I got married earlier, then I wouldn't be caught in this. It was just a three to four year gap before I ended taking care of the children and I had to take care of, of my mother. Second, the other thing also, there's a new phenomenon that you must have been aware of. Starting 2005 and onwards, because um, I, I discovered something while I was trying to run a course on population and development. I invited somebody from the, at that time it was still called as National Statistics, Census and Statistics Board. And this lady said that more and more women, or more and more, yeah, more and more babies were being born outside marriage. At that time, the, she gave the number at, at around 38%. And then in 2017, as I was reviewing statistics on birth and population, the PSA said that 54% of babies born 
in the Philippines in 2017 came from temporary relationships, 54%. And out of this 54%, only one-fourth were born in a stable relationship. That says a lot about us girls. We are very adventurous, meaning, wow, I can afford to raise a child by myself. Or we say, I want to have a child, but I don't want a husband. You know, I mean, there are people who are thinking along those lines. I want to have babies. I don't want to, ha to have a husband. So is this, are these unwanted pregnancies or are they planned pregnancies, knowing that it doesn't matter whether they got married to the father of their child or not? And it does affect people because those children who were born in 2015 are now 14 years old. And I know because, unfortunately or fortunately, I'm running two schools. I'm the president of one college here, but I'm also the president of my school in Pampanga. You know, it's a very small school, 150 children. And at Miriam College, there's around 6,500 students. So I can see the trend. More and more children are coming from single parent families. And the single parents are almost always females. And therefore, the mothers, you know, their mental health and their stresses, it's coming out. Because maybe they were so brave in their youth and say, I can raise a child alone. Now they know it's hard to be a mother. And for us who are in education, we have to take care of the child because the child has to you know, take, handle the reality that he or she belongs to a single parent family and how does he navigate the world with a single parent. So this is something that perhaps we should have, we should take a look at also why we have a growing number of female single parents and what is the motivation behind that. I'm also thinking of what uh, Congressman Salceda said, that we should start feeding the child as soon as they, are, that they are born. I beg to disagree. You have to start feeding the mother as soon as she conceives. Everybody knows that the brain growth happens in the womb, not outside. Once you are born as a baby, the potential of your brain is already there. So that if you were not fed properly between the gestation period up to the time you were born, whatever intervention you do after birth is minimal because the promise of the, of the intelligence of the child, it happens while the mother, while your, what they call the, the endoplasm and the microplasm are still multiplying and they're becoming into the fetus that a, a mother will carry. So, so perhaps we should also take a look at perhaps educate women and say, look, if you want to get pregnant, you want to give birth to healthy children, consider your health, consider what you are eating, because that will affect, you know, that will affect the intelligence of your, of your children. So I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful, really. I'm glad that, you know, this, this book was uh, written. What my comments right now are just offshoots of what has been done. Uh, in, in all the chapters, and it is true. And, the only, and one thing that I'm most happy about, at least, was that the, the discovery that children of educated mothers, whether they are working or not, have a better chance of moving up academically than the children of mothers who were not adequately mod, uh, educated, whether in the labor force or not. In other words, the, in the education of the mother has a direct impact on the child, whether she's in the labor force or not. So thank you again very much, Pits, for, for this uh, wonderful work. And, and I, I know that you'll continue on with this. And if there's any way um, my school can contribute to your efforts, I'll be willing to work with you. Th thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for your anecdotes, um, Ambassador. Our next speaker um, works as a counselor at the Australian Embassy in the Philippines. She has a 20-year experience in international relations and development. Prior to her uh, current position, she was a director in the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trades Scholarships and Alumni Branch. She was previously posted to Fiji as Counselor for Pacific Regional Development, working on gender, education, and health. 
Prior to joining the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, she worked for the United Nations and other INGOs on democratization, fragility, and civic education in Timor-Leste, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Sudan. She earned her Master's of Political Science from the University of Glasgow. Friends, let's all welcome Ms. Shona Makina. <laughs> that music whoever put that together thank you very much and also um, could I please thank PIDS very much for inviting me today um, ambassador del Rosario I have two other siblings so I'm a bit concerned that maybe I'm the spare <laughs> anyway let's see how we go today so congratulations to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies on the launch of outside looking in as has been said already, the first PIDS book focused on gender equality in the Philippines. Outside Looking In reflects PIDS' appreciation of the gender differences in economic opportunities, challenges and results. And an understanding of these gender gaps is crucial to achieving inclusive growth, one where truly no person, no man or woman, is left behind. Australia recognises that gender equality is a human right and respecting all human rights and freedoms makes Australia and the world a safer, more secure and more prosperous place. Conversely, gender inequality undermines global prosperity, stability and security and it contributes to and often exacerbates a range of challenges including poverty. Australia pursues gender equality as a core value and a top priority across our foreign policy, economic diplomacy and development investments. In our aid program, we have tracked the performance of our aid investments to deliver gender equality results since 2010 and our target is for more than 80% of our aid investments, regardless of their objectives, to be effectively addressing gender issues in their implementation. This is an ambitious target and we haven't actually met it yet. But I'm very proud that our government has given us that target and is very transparent about reporting. And in fact, our last report in the 2017-18 cycle reported that 75% of our aid investments are effectively addressing gender issues. So we still have some way to go. We focus on women's economic empowerment because the evidence shows that increasing women's participation in the economy strengthens economic growth. According to a recent study, advancing women's equality in the countries of Asia Pacific could add $4.5 trillion to their collective annual GDP by 2025. That's a 12% increase over a business as usual GDP trajectory. One of our major aid investments focused on women's economic empowerment is investing in women. And through this initiative, we promote economic growth, business development and workplace gender equality in several Southeast Asian countries, including the Philippines. And we do this by working with business coalitions which help their members adopt more inclusive workplace practices. We also work with financial investors to increase private investment in women-led small and medium enterprises in Southeast Asia. And also through investing in women, we work with partners to positively shift gender norms and attitudes to support women in the world of work. Quality education for Filipino girls and boys is also a key priority and an area that Australia has worked on closely with the Philippines for more than 30 years. Through our partnerships with the Department of Education at the national level and the Ministry of Education in the new Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, we are working to improve equitable access for quality education for boys and girls. So the book that we're launching today provides Philippine stakeholders fresh insights on gender equality, including women and men's contributions through their work in the home and issues confronting education of boys and girls. I feel that I uh, may have been invited here to speak because I am an outsider looking in. So I would like to focus today 
on areas of interest that I found in the book and also share with you Australia's relevant experience in those areas. So as the book makes clear, it's boys' education that is lagging in the Philippines, both in participation and performance. While enrolment rates are comparable, boys drop out in much greater numbers than girls. The impact evaluation that Australia supported last year for the Philippines Social Protection Program similarly found that the four Ps helped keep younger boys in school, but that impact dwindled as children grew older. An interesting issue explored in the, the chapter is the positive effect of male teachers on boys' educational participation and performance. Almost 90% of Filipino teachers are women, so attracting more men into the profession could help. Australia's Step Up Teaching Scholarship Initiative to help recruit more men into the profession has had modest success, but women still apply for the profession in much greater numbers than men. Meanwhile, Chapter 3 explores regional education disparities, noting that sons and daughters in the arm have the lowest mean schooling across all cohorts. Only 54% of children in the Bangsamoro complete their elementary education and only 10% complete secondary school. This is why Australia's largest education program in the Philippines, which is called Education Pathways to Peace, is working in the BAM and focuses on more equitable participation of boys and girls in quality early grades education. Our hope is that by addressing disparities early on, we will be able to influence children's longer term educational performance. The regional patterns and analysis explored in Chapter 3 reveal the need for more nuanced approaches to data collection and interpretation. And I encourage PIDs to continue to elucidate the regional and sub-regional disparities. In Chapter 4, the authors highlighted a measure of the value on unpaid caring work. Whilst it gives us a glimpse of the enormous economic contribution of women that is otherwise invisible, it highlights the disproportionate burden on women to do caring work. This chapter also underlines the need for time use surveys, which provides the most accurate measure of how much of their day individuals devote to activities such as paid work, unpaid work, including household chores, child and elderly care and self-care. Australia itself has come a long way when it comes to realising the importance of time use surveys in addressing gender equality. The Australian Bureau of Statistics undertook a national survey in 2006 on how Australians use their time, understanding the economic value of unpaid work and how families share caring work at home has helped design employment policies such as flexible work arrangements to provide people with greater opportunities. The Australian Government will be reinstating that time use survey in 2020 in recognition of the changes in the way Australians work and the new technologies that we use compared to more than a decade ago. The new survey will collect information about how Australians balance their time between work, family, leisure, caring and other activities to help government design policies to fit the way Australians actually live their lives. I have to say that some of the research cited and the conclusions formed in Chapter 4 made me somewhat uncomfortable, suggesting that women may deliberately forego participation in the labour market to enrich their home environment, or that it may be counterproductive to raise female participation in market work in light of the important role women play in home production and the quality of children. Even the title of the chapter, Counting Women's Work, plays into a gender-biased view. Suggesting that many women have the freedom to make a rational choice regarding their gendered roles in family and work life can ignore the human side of economics. It assumes that traditional theory holds true, that all people are rational, that our choices are based on practicality and utility, and that we update our beliefs based on new information and evidence. But for both men and women, when it comes to the field of work inside and outside of the home, we cannot ignore societal and cultural pressures, let alone feelings of guilt, judgment or shame. I think this chapter illuminates some valid points, but reveals areas for future examination 
regarding behavioural economics and the gendered assumptions of opportunity and choice when it comes to work. With regards to these gender norms and behaviours, Chapter 5 shines a light on the tension between the work and family roles of both women and men. It suggests that although family responsibilities are linked to the workforce participation of both genders, the impact is much more pronounced among women. These insights underscore the disproportionate pressure on women in the Philippines to be homemakers above all else. Even when they want to work in the formal sector, women feel forced to perform traditional roles making them more likely than men to forego work in the formal sector when faced with the need to care for the home. But it shows that men too face pressures to be good providers, even when they take on full responsibility for housework. So both of those data points highlight the need to deepen the analysis of how social norms impact the extent to which women participate in the economy and how men participate at home. Through Australia's Investing in Women, Care International is carrying out some qualitative in-depth research on the impact of social norms in Vietnam on women's participation as office and factory workers. I hope that through Investing in Women, such research work could actually be replicated in relevant sectors here in the Philippines. The gender pay gap is another important statistic that's crucial in understanding the disparity between women and men in the economy. And chapter six is an interesting uh, example of how gender disaggregated and finer data can reveal how women continue to be disadvantaged in this regard. It shows that in agriculture, the biggest contributor to the gender pay gap is the differences in wages between women and men who perform the same activity. And this insight addresses the inaccurate assumption that the gender pay gap is based on a variance in productivity between genders. It would be interesting to understand the extent to which gender-based wage bias persists in other sectors of the economy here. For, ex for instance, there are opportunities for PIDs to leverage growing interest in collecting data on the gender pay gap in the private sector. In Australia, the full-time gender pay gap across all industries in the formal sector sits at 14.1%. In response to this and other factors, Australia is the only country in the world which has established a workplace gender equality agency. The agency is charged with promoting and improving gender equality in Australian workplaces, and it does this by collecting and analysing gender pay gap data alongside other gender data from large companies, enabling employers to identify areas for focus, develop informed strategies and measure performance against peers over time. Last month, we had the Workplace Gender Equality Agency Director from Australia, Libby Lyons, visit the Philippines, and she shared her agency's experiences in collecting gender data in the Australian private sector. We hope that the Australian experience will be a useful lesson in the Philippines context, particularly as the Philippine Business Coalition for Women's Empowerment, or the PBCW, collects gender pay data and other gender indicators from its 11 members. These firms are large, influential employers. PBCW is also advocating for the inclusion of such data in annual reporting of companies to government. Analyzing such data in the Philippines context is another area for future possible research opportunities. So in closing, I would like to recognize and underscore the important role that PIDS plays in informing the Philippine government's socioeconomic policy. For government policymakers to recognise the need for gender equality and act towards it, they need strong, evidence-based policy advice that acknowledges and addresses the gaps between women and men. It is often said that we cannot change what we do not measure, and I therefore applaud PIDS for its leadership role in developing an evidence base. Through the robust and rigorous data collection and analysis, to help us understand and address the gender equality issues that we confront today. So thank you all very much. Good afternoon. Thanks for sharing your
your thoughts, Ms. Makine. For the fourth speaker, he is currently the National Project Coordinator of the Safe and Fair Program of the International Labor Organization in the Philippines. Safe and Fair is part of the Global European Union United Nations Spotlight Initiative to Eliminate Violence Against Women and Girls, which is being implemented in the 10 ASEAN countries, including the Philippines. He worked for 20 years in Hong Kong as a migrant worker and later as the executive director of the Asian Migrant Center, a migrant research and advocacy NGO. He helped um, establish and build the Migrant Forum in Asia, which is the biggest network of migrant organizations and um, civil gr society groups in Asia with members and uh, partners in more than 20 Asian countries. He also served as a migrant representative in the NEDA Subcommittee on International Migration and Development in Region 6, as well as in the Dolet Regional Tripartite Industrial Peace Council in the same region. Friends, let us now hear from Mr. Rex Varona. Hello, Mike. Uh, magandang hapon sa atin lahat. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm the Rose among the Thorns. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will be reacting, so I did not prepare a structured uh, piece. But uh, we'd like to congratulate PIDS for uh, publishing this, primarily for us because it gives some quantification. Uh, as uh, Ambassador uh, De Rosario was saying, uh, we have anecdotal uh, references of the pay gap, the glass ceiling, and all, but having a book that more or less have cohorts and the process of quantification is really important in terms of especially policy and formulation. So, uh, so I'd like to start my intervention by saying that one of the, another big elephant in the room in this case is in, in terms of searching for better working opportunities or even increasing the LFPR, the labor force participation of women, is migration. We have been for 40 years. We are running into the 50th year of organized Filipino migration. We started in 1974 with the labor code. So uh, in 2024, it will be 50 years. And yet, as was said in the book, the Philippines has one of the lowest uh, LFPR, especially for women, in Asia. No? About less than 50% as compared to, as they were saying, Singapore and other East Asian countries, which runs about 60 to 80 percent, and then uh, just comparable with Malaysia and even lower than Laos and Vietnam. This is in chapter three. So one of the reflections is the East Asian countries are able to have higher LFPR for women precisely because they import a lot of other women to take over the jobs at home. That's why Singapore Hong Kong, they have hundreds of thousands of women, largely domestic workers, and a big chunk of that would be Filipinos. So if their labor markets are able, therefore, to release more of the women into the productive labor force, the paid labor force, so what happens in the Philippines? Is labor migration, therefore, in the Philippines a good policy in terms of uh, increasing the participation of women. The book mentions several laws that have been passed by the Philippines in order to hopefully create a more conducive environment for women to go into paid market work. It mentions uh, RA 9710, the Magna Carta of Women, the many anti-violence laws, the Kasambahay Law, RA 11299. But it did not mention that many of the other labor migration-related laws are in fact also trying to increase. So RA 8042, RA 122, RA 11299, and all these laws that actually encourages more of the Filipinos to work abroad. So having that experience after so many years, what happens? The Philippines now has about 10 million overseas Filipinos. Approximately half of that are women. Every year, we have about roughly 2.3 million. I did not bring my slides, but uh, we can share it later on. Uh, uh, PSA data says that we have about 2.3 million overseas Filipino workers in any given year. 
and more than half of that were women. In the last five years especially, uh, the, the percentage of women as proportion of all overseas Filipinos has increased below 50 to now about 56%. So if you're talking about feminization, this is one hard proof that it, it has been happening. And the gender pattern is more than half of the annual outflows are women, especially mostly in domestic work, which brings me to an intervention point. If the gender pay gap and then the display, the the hindrance to go to the labor market prevents women to for for paid productive work. So why are millions of our Filipino women going out as domestic workers? So as I, I share uh, uh, our Australian colleagues' statement that one of the chapters, chapter four says that because of the nurturing role of women, perhaps releasing them from the household might be counterproductive because there's a, there's a strong correlation between the nurturing role of parents in the school performance of the children. So if you remove the nurturer in the house who will assume that role and therefore the children uh, by consequence would suffer more in terms of uh, performance in school. So hopefully the conclusion is not that women will maintain that, but hopefully the men and women will share that role. Now I think the conclusion of the book is you could not remove that function that school is not the only nurturing environment in terms of education, but the home is as equally important. So if we could not remove that reality, who assumes that role? And that's where the, the gender roles therefore has to be deeply examined. Uh, but, but anyway, my point is, so uh, if the point is not being able to access the labor market because of the gender roles forces women to stay at home, so why is it that the biggest sector every year that goes out of the Philippines are in the care services, domestic work, caregivers, etc. So does that mean that they can break away, that the women can break away from the social pressures if there is a wage differential where they can actually earn higher? The other question is, sorry I'm posing these questions because I think my primary reaction to the book is, yeah, migration is an elephant in the room. When we calculate LFPR or even uh, productivity, how does migration factor in that calculation? So if we say LFPR is low for women, how did we count the more than one million women that have worked every year, that are working every year, going out every year as domestic workers abroad? Uh, by the way, since 2016, we have been sending out more than two million Filipinos every year, just every year. So that's how big the population is. And and the other thing is when we say that there's a big wage differential, how do we count the wages of the women? If they are domestic workers abroad, their minimum wage should be 400 US dollars a month. How does that impact on the wage differential between men and women? I think statistics count the, the earnings of the women as remittance, but they might not be counted as income of the women, therefore, the implication might be then we say that, again, stereotypically, women have much less income than men across similar work. In the ILO category, it will be called elementary jobs, no? uh, level one, uh, if you're in domestic work or labor, uh, uh, basic labor. But if you count, therefore, the earnings of the migrant women abroad, would you say that, therefore, women might be earning higher, much more uh, than men in the elementary uh, job category? So we are just posing this because if we therefore, the, the other implication that we also want to highlight is BSP, uh, Central Bank Statistics say that in the past 30 years at least, they do a quarterly uh, consumer expectation survey of OFW families. In the last 30 years, more than 95% of OFW families depend on remittance for basic food and basic household needs, less than 6% invest, less than 20% save, about 20% save, which is lower than the national savings rate. So one question is, where did all the remittance go? 
But my question is, if for food and basic needs, 95% of the household depends on the remittance, who earns in the family? If for every OFW there are four dependents, does that mean that the four others left in the Philippines drop out of the labor force? Because they could not invest, they could not save, and they have to depend on the remittance for basic needs. So how does that impact productivity? Now, as my colleague Nasserli was saying, it's not simply participation that we want, or not even the page gap, pay, uh, wage gap as such. But importantly, productivity, because that's how countries compare their competitiveness with each other. So if we say that we have more than 32 billion US dollars a year in remittance, but the result of that is the three other members of the household actually drop out of the labor force because they just wait for the remittance to come in, they don't have any other income, then the strategic impact on the country is it lowers the productivity rate of the country. And if therefore statistics is blind on the role of women in that, the conclusion would be that yeah, we are improving because of all the remittance, but the strategic impact would be we are distorting the labor market, you know, because yeah, the women's contribution, even if they go into paid Market work is not any more counted in this case. And on chapter three, which is on the children and performance, uh, there was a strong statement that the educated uh, parents, uh, mothers in particular, who are in the labor force correlate with having better performing children. So in this case, many of, and then as uh, uh, the researcher was uh, describing earlier, in chapter four, they concluded that there's a strong correlation of how nurtured the child is and the child's uh, performance in school. But in this case, if two million of the households every year do not have their mothers because they went abroad for overseas, so who nurtured the children back home? The 2016 study of uh, PSA on the uh, National Migration Survey says that in instances where the one of the parents go abroad, and then it, it is the father who goes abroad, the mother, 80% of the families, the mother takes care of the children, and therefore the family is intact. But the reverse is, if the mother goes abroad, and then the father is left behind, the fathers don't take care of the children. It's either distributed to other relatives or they get uh, Kasambahay Joey was asking what is uh, uh, English of Kasambahay in the Isle of Parlance is domestic work. Now there's an international convention 189 that says they should not be called servants or maids but they should be called domestic workers because they do work. So that's the official uh, terminology. So, so then therefore the, the implication is again if the, if, if the perf school performance of the child is contingent on the parent nurturing them then would it be the case that therefore the household or the children of migrants might actually be performing poorly in schools because their parents are not there? And anecdotally, if the dropout rates of many of the boys whose parents might be migrants, is there a correlation of how negatively impacted the children are by the absence of their parents, especially the mothers? So I, uh, there are a lot more questions that we want to pose, but I think I'll end by saying, therefore, that we would really love if PIDS would do a, a continuing study, especially on factoring in migration. Now, if we somehow disaggregate also the data on all of these impacts between non-OFW and OFW household and children, perhaps we can also then, therefore, uh, give guidance to our policymakers on whether migration policy in the Philippines is actually helping strengthen the country, or it actually degrades and endangers the future of the country and the children. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Varona. We are down to our last speaker. She is a schools division superintendent at the Department of Education in Region 4A. She served as education program super supervisor at Dep Ed 4A and an assistant schools division superintendent of Depet Rizal. Her expertise 
is on educational leadership, quality management system, and environmental studies. She is currently taking up her doctoral, doctoral um, degree in development studies at UP Los Baños. She was hailed as an outstanding uh, English teacher of Calabarzon in 2006, as well as uh, an outstanding alumni of the Al Philippine Normal University in, University in 2009. She was also recognized as the 2018 Outstanding wo Woman of DepEd Calabarzon. Friends, let's now hear from Ms. Cherry Lou Repia. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. In behalf of our USEC, Josdado San Antonio, thank you for the invitation po sa PIDS and for forcing me, unquote, quote, unquote, to finish, re to finish reading the book in a way that it, is felt, it felt like a, a reading because I have a reflection paper to submit for my grad graduate course. Ako nga po yung taga DepEd na kaninang ino-okra ni Congressman Salceda. <laughs> At nasabi ko na rin po kay USEC Dads, ang lahat ng hanas ng ating ano, butihing representante ng albay. So alam na po nila yun ngayon. Kasi sila po yung dapat sumagot nun, hindi ako. Allow me first to begin by sharing with you my context. I'm not from the central office. I'm in the field office. I'm the school's division superintendent of DepEd Rizal. Uh, doon yung lugar na unang nagkaroon ng ano, confirmation of local transmission of ENCOB. Pero hindi, sigurado po akong wala akong dala. Ngayon, ano ho, to sa Kaintariza, that's under my care. So, kanina, kanina lang po, going here, I was called by our governor, sabi niya, we have a meeting today at 1 p.m. Sabi ko, Gov, hindi pwede kasi I am on my way to an event in which I was asked by the USEC to represent him. So, um, ayaw niya ng may ibang kapalit, kaya po sabi niya, sige, cancel na lang, tomorrow na lang. So, yun po yung aking mga, kung na namoblema kayo, kung matutuloy, Ma'am Selly ba? Ma'am Selly, kung namoblema, kung matutuloy ba ito, hindi, isa rin ako sa namoblema doon kasi hindi ko makakuha ng, ng kapalit ko Dahil nga kailangan kong basahin yung isang libro na napaka-technical for an educator like me and to react correspondingly. Kasi sa first three, first two chapters, sobrang it's all about DepEd. For the first ano, chapters three, four, and five, it still has implication to, to DepEd, especially to our students. I'm working in DepEd Rizal and with 325 schools, under my care and manned by 14,673 teachers, of which 83% are female. So, yan po yung mga pinag-uusapan dun sa data kanina, no? dun sa book. And we have 430,000 uh, students with almost one is to one ratio of male and female students. And definitely, this data came into me as I read the, the, the books, the book that, uh, was, that will be launched today. Actually, chill lang ako sa mga gender issues. Kasi feeling ko, napaka-dominant ng mga babae sa DepEd. Ang dami naming babae sa DepEd. 83% ng workforce namin ay babae. So, ano pa ang reklamo namin? No? In terms of promotion, are dominant pa rin ang girls or the women in the promotion in DepEd. And even in the uh, highest position, the CES positions in DepEd, most of us are also women. So, hindi siya masyadong issue for me, no, being in the DepEd. And the Department of Education has issued a gender-responsive basic education policy to yung DepEd Order 32 last 2017 that commits to integrate the principles of gender equality, gender equity, gender sensitivity, non-discrimination, and human rights in the provision and governance of basic education. It enables DepEd to, to address both enduring and emerging gender and sexuality-related issues in basic education 
that's why most of our, if not all, our teachers' guide, learners' materials, learning resources are um, developed in a way that God issues or God concerns and principles are considered in, in those materials. Before, I mean, I was still the one doing those things as teachers. As a teacher, I, it was not talked about. God issues were not talked about in any of the resource materials in around, I was a teacher in 1997 up to 2000. So, yung panahon na yon, hindi But in the recent times, especially in the K-12 curriculum materials, these things are very much in, considered in the materials for children. So, it, it seems for me that DepEd is responsive on God concerns. However, Reading through the facts and figures presented in the book gave me a disruptive and reflective weekend. The gendered thoughts that were triggered by the book challenged my current mental model. Nakaka, nakaka, ano, for me, nakaka um, stress. Nakaka, parang di ako pinapat, pinatulog nung mga bandabasa ko dun sa book, actually. I was disturbed. Two uh, sleepless nights ako ng weekend. Nagigising ako after three to uh, four hours of uh, sleep. And I was thinking about the, what the book is actually telling me. So congratulations, BIDS, for this book because it definitely provides great inputs in making learning environment a happy place for both boys and girls, but with preferential attention with the learning needs of the boys. Kanina nung nagpe-present si Ma'am Connie, tama po ba? Sabi niya, yung sa education daw, boys have higher dropout rates, lower enrollment at all levels, and have lower test scores. And I say amen to that. Totoo po yun. Totoo yun. Na mas maraming dropout na boys, mas mababa ng konti. Konti lang naman sa kalabars no, ng konti ang enrollment kaysa sa girls. Halos one is to one ngayon ratio. So, hindi naman ganun ka. Pero mababa pa rin in terms of number. So, it's around, um, in depth and result, it's around 18,000 more girls than boys. Malaki pa rin if you will look at numbers. But if it's ratio, parang hindi masyado mapapansin. And as regards to the test course, yes, usually, mas ano, achiever talaga ang girls sa classroom than the boys. Enduring issue sa akin ang mga dahilan kung bakit nga ba mas maraming batang lalaki sa mga classroom ang may struggle sa pag-aaral. I was a classroom teacher and I saw that myself. No? Bakit sila yung mga marurupok na madalas maging drop out? Bakit nga ba yung mga boys na to? No? This book answered my questions and gave me sleepless nights last weekend and I found the research findings cited in the book our empirical evidences helpful in directing the path of schools towards quality is basic education, which is the call of Sulong Edukalidad. Kung narinig na po yung Sulong Edukalidad after the announcement of our um, Reina Elena situation in PISA results. No? Sa aming mga taga DepEd, mas masakit pa siya sa breakup, yung PISA results. So, sa ngayon, we're really working hard on it and so that we can make it sure that our learners are more are more prepared for for critical thinking test items. No, we don't like that to happen. But again, but of course, taking the test in 2021 parang masyadong kokonti yung preparation namin. But we're working so hard on this already. Ayun na namin ng ganong pakiramdam. And yes, as a school leader and educator. Thoughts have been hovering in my mind on the effects of the dominance of female teachers on the house of learning. Pansin na pansin ko po yan when I was a principal. I was wondering if the boys really like what the teachers are asking them to do, like dance or, you know, sing or read poems. Do they really like that? I really don't know because most of my my boys in my class did not enjoy that. And, but most of the teachers do that in their classes. So, bakit kaya, ano kaya yung effect? And, and seeing the, the, the one of the articles, parang sa chapter 2 yata ito. 
one of the research studies, sabi ko, meron din pala talaga na, ano, na reason or basis yung aking pagtatanong when I was a school head. And so, this is definitely uh, a research topic that we need to work on. Um, we have a fund for that, for basic education research, and uh, this is one topic that we need to work on so that we can lessen the, you know, the, the bad effects of having a dominant uh, girl girl ways in a classroom hindi yung female teacher yung wrong but it's more of yung the girl the girly ways of teachers that are adapted sometimes by this, by our kids no parang nakakakita actually ako ng video ng mga kindergarten learners who are nagkakembot sila but they are they are ano boys talaga yon kaya lang kasi yung teacher ganun niya itinuturo yung sayaw wala siya yung boy version so nagkakaroon yata ng may may, may I, I realize my point then yung mga complaints dati ng mga parents na bakit daw yung mga kids nila when they go home they are doing the girl stuff and they 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 are quite unhappy about it that the teachers are providing too much of girl ways rather than uh, providing uh, something that is neutral for both and neutral for both uh, girls and boys in the classroom. Definitely, the teaching guides right now, the other learning resources developed, are very much uh, adhering to God principles and concerns. But definitely, the ways of the female teachers have a certain effect on boys, and we we in DepEd must look on this matter. At present, DepEd is facing the challenge of ensuring quality education in all schools. Problema talaga ito. Uh, we have to ensure quality education not, on, uh, not, as, not looking into just one big school, but we have to look on the learning experience that the children have in, in the classroom. So, as a superintendent of 325 schools, I'm really looking into every detail in the classroom, even how it's arranged, how how the children are grouped in activities, because it this might have an effect for the boys and for the girls in the classroom. And I agree with Congressman so said that the, the key elements to achieve quality basic education is parental and community involvement. Sabi nga niya, missing link talaga yung community. Kasi binibigay ng central office yung mga needs, um, binibigay ng local government yung needs, pero yung community-driven schooling of the children, mukhang doon talaga kailangan mag-work kami. Thus, DepEd Rizal initiates a reading program which is community-driven, dubbed as Blue Rizal Barangayan para sa bawat bata bumabasa or BRB4. It has a goal of engaging stakeholders to address education needs of the children. And we hope to create reading culture in Rizal. With this, we can address the education needs of the boys as well. Because um, most often than not, many of the non-readers are boys. Most of the non-readers in schools are boys. And definitely, the educational attainment of the of the parents have something to has a contribution to this situation and also the way that um, we are pressing our girls to to be more disciplined be more responsible rather than uh, while the boys are just taken aside on how they will they are just given a very free way of how they will um how they will how how they will they will um take charge of their roles in the in the houses napakalax pagdating sa boys even in the schools we also notice that the the leaders are usually the girls in in the, in the group work so it has um uh, these small ways of reading up the kids in the classrooms have effect on the the schooling of both the girls and the boys and we in DepEd would like to to thank PIDS for coming up with the book and this is uh, 
definitely a, a wake up call for a superintendent like me and I definitely I will definitely share the pwede ko ba i-share yun yung e-copy niya may e-copy kasi akong hawak pwede ko bang i-share or dapat i-share ko the book itself So we're not allowed to, I'm not allowed to share the book, the e-book. Ah, yes, okay. So I will share the e-book to the rest of our colleagues, um, superintendents, as well as um, for our God focal persons in every school and in every uh, offices, is for uh, to share with them this book so that they can redirect our God activities from simply um, team building activities or some seminars to something more responsive for the children. Kasi sa ngayon, tama naman si Congressman Salceda, mahalaga ang focus ay bata. Mahalaga ang focus is the um, capability development of the children and make it sure that they are given what they deserve in the classroom. So thank you so much sa inyong lahat at Sa DepEd po, nagmamahal kami ng mga bata. So tulungan nyo kami. Salamat po and God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Repia. Uh, we, ha we do have the e-copy of the book on the PIDS website. But if you want to have a, uh, a copy, you may buy it from PIDS. Okay, so, uh, yes. So, um, okay, um, since we, have, we are pressed for time, uh, we will skip the open forum part of the program, and um, but before that, we would like to thank the speakers for their relevant insights and comprehensive information about the about women-related um, issues. So, let's give them a big hand, please. <laughs> to wrap up our activity this afternoon, may I call on Miss Maria Cristina Josefina Balmes, the Deputy Executive Director for Operations and Concurrent. Acting Project Manager of the Great Women Project 2 of the uh, Philippine Commission on Women. Ms. Balmes? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a pleasant uh, good afternoon to each and every one of you. We at the Philippine Commission on Women, the National Machinery for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment, would like to extend our deepest appreciation to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, uh, which has always been the pioneer in research and providing policy-oriented studies and publications on pressing developmental and societal issues. Your efforts help strengthen our goals of pursuing gender equality and advancing women's rights. As we continue to identify and address different issues and problems in our country, let us not forget the significance of research in our day-to-day -day life. Research, by its very essence, is a vital tool in identifying and analyzing the proper intervention that we in government should make in order to bring about just and real change in our country. As a result of your rigorous research and serious hard work, this book entitled Outside Looking In, Gendered Perspectives in Work and Education, gives us a comprehensive overview about the status of women and men in the labor sector and in education. This important piece of work explores the various untapped issues that our citizens still face despite the changes and gains in our narrowing the gender gap. This shows that more has to be done. In addition, the book unveils a lot of realities involving gender. While we continue to promote women's empowerment, let us also be reminded that the quest for gender equality is not only limited to women. One issue that is discussed in the book and has been discussed by our speakers earlier is the apparent lag in the education of boys. We at the Commission see this problem as equally important as to the education of girls. As stipulated in the implementing rules and regulations of the Magna Carta of Women, all individuals are equal and no one should be discriminated against on the basis of economic, social, political, and geographic origins. The law has also recognized that gender equality means 
the equality of men and women and their rights to reach their full potential. In this book launching, PCW would like to commend PIDS for spearheading this great initiative, which is just in time for the celebration of the National Women's Month. Let us give them a round of applause. I am confident that this book will be instrumental as we craft gender responsive policies and fulfill the needs of our people in different areas such as in the labor sector and education. So this Women's Month, it is time to recommit ourselves to the twin goals of gender equality and women's empowerment. We call on the government agencies and other stakeholders to dub double your efforts to mainstream gender and development in your plans and programs. We call on law enforcers to ensure the protection of women and girls for gender-based violence. And we call on educational institutions to end practices that, that perpetuate gender-based discrimination and stereotypes. We call for timely and appropriate services to women's needs, especially those who are affected by disasters, armed conflict, and violence against women. We call for adequate health services for all women, and we call on media outfits to champion women's rights through balanced and empowering portrayal of women in media, film, and advertising. We call on everyone to recognize and support women in agriculture, science, sports, environmental pre preservation, economics, and ever emerging industries like data science and artificial intelligence. Uh, with us, uh, with PCW, let us enable every Huana to show how extraordinary women can be by tearing down barriers to gender equality, ending discrimination, and fighting sexism and toxic masculinity. Let us continue the power of research in elevating women empowerment and in making gender equality a live reality. Let us all make change work for women. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Abalme. So that concludes our activity this afternoon. But before you go, may we request you to please fill out the survey form given to you earlier and leave them to the Secretariat. Again, on behalf of PIDS, we would like to thank you and see you on our uh, future activities. Um, by the way, uh, all presentations today will be uploaded on our PIDS website, so you may want to visit it.